us out together when all I see is a battle. When all I see is a battle, you see my victory. When all I see is a mountain, you see the mountain move. And as I walk through the shadow, your love surrounds me. There's nothing to fear now, for I am safe with you. Sing this out. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And if you are for me, who can be against me? For Jesus, there's nothing impossible for you. When all I see are the ashes, you see the beauty. stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadow. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. An almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadow, you win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. An almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadow. But 
then you came along and put me back together. Now every desire is now satisfied here in your
give life. You give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord. It's your breath. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. You give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. And great
except for my heart singing hallelujah
Lord, tonight we just do render our hearts to you, Lord, and give you our love. Lord, we want to recognize that in, in areas where there has been a, stri a struggle or a fight over the affections and attentions of our heart, Lord, we just pray that you would captivate us anew and afresh, Lord, and that we would see the cross, that we would see Jesus high and lifted up in a way that changes us and transforms us, Lord. Lord, we just commit this session to you as we get into your word. We ask, Holy Spirit, that you would speak uh, to our hearts in a way that only you are able. We open our ears to hear what the Spirit would have to say to the church. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, why don't you guys say hi to someone real quick around you, and you can have a seat. All right. That's the one thing when I, um, well, one of many things when I moved to the Midwest and I had to be careful when you tell the church to say hi to one another, it becomes like, you know, fellowship day and it just never ends. <laughs> it's so good. Um, once again, you guys, welcome. Before we get into our study tonight, I wanted to give just a couple of uh, things. I'll mention them again tomorrow, but uh, just for the week ahead, just to keep in your heart and your mind, uh, maybe jot it down. First of all, if you need any help with anything around the facility, you have any questions about what's going on, uh, you might see a few volunteers that have a bright yellow shirt on. Uh, that's, those are people uh, that, that can help you, point you in the right direction, so feel free to, to grab one of them if you need anything at all. And then real quick, tomorrow morning is actually our official check-in. So between 7.30 a.m. and the start of the first session, we have a breakfast. Uh, and I think they're making some biscuits and gravy and all sorts of good food. So you can come. You can check in. You can get your shirt. You can get your name tag, your, your booklet for the week. And uh, we'd love for you guys just to come and, and grab that stuff before the first session starts tomorrow. There's also a devotion at 8 o'clock in the morning tomorrow. So you're not going to want to miss that. Uh, and then tomorrow evening session um, is going to be pretty much open to our church. So uh, we're going to invite everyone out to come join us tomorrow evening for the 6.30 session tomorrow evening. So keep that in mind. Um, and we will have some more announcements tomorrow. But enough of that for tonight. Let's, let's get into God's Word. Um, excited this week to have a couple uh, uh, not only good friends, faithful pastors who have been serving the Lord in the ministry for, for some time within the Calvary Chapel movement, and we're glad to have with us tonight from Vision City Church, um, Garrett Bueller. So let's give him a warm uh, Midwest welcome. Well, thank you. Uh, good evening and welcome. And I am so thrilled to be here with you guys this evening. And 
Uh, for those of you that have not already put two and two together, I'm actually Pastor Josh's uh, stunt double. Uh, him and I, last time I spoke here at Grace St. Joe, uh, it was right when Josh had started uh, leading uh, in his uh, pastoral uh, capacity here at the church. And I walked in the back doors and people were calling me Pastor Josh. And I thought, oh, this could be very fun today. Uh, so that when he comes back from his trip that uh, he'd be greeted with a whole bunch of uh, people that attended his church and had very interesting things to say about him. Uh, but without any further ado, I just want to say first and foremost that we are so so, so happy. Uh, some of you guys have traveled for a great distance. Uh, I, I've heard maybe 10 hours some of you guys have driven, maybe more. Uh, under, I mean, you're here tonight uh, for a very special purpose, and that purpose is to glorify the name of Jesus and to be encouraged in your calling. And I like to ask that as we kick off this conference uh, that you would really, really, in your seats even now, just ask the Lord to speak to you over the next couple of days. I believe that God is the God that meets us exactly where we're at. He understands the things that we're wrestling with and working through. And the Lord is concerned with you. And whatever it is that is trying to cause you to sink down, that the Lord, we've been praying that the Lord would lift you up out of whatever that is. And today, there might be some of you that are extremely discouraged in the ministry. Maybe you're even here tonight as a last ditch attempt to, you know, maybe see if it's salvageable and that you've wrestled with discouragement and wondering if, you know, you're even to continue moving forward. Uh, there's some of you that need to be reminded tonight that the work that you're doing for the Lord is a very, very important work and that you shouldn't stop. There are also some of you, no doubt, that are battling even depression, loneliness, feeling down. And you need to be encouraged to not let the enemy take you down. Because the only time that the enemy will stop attacking you or your family or your ministry is when you're deceased. That's it. And until you're deceased, Satan's goal is for you to desist in your service unto the Lord. So deceased or desist, either or or both. But the passage of Scripture that we're going to be looking at today, I pray, would minister to you as it has ministered to me. If you have your Bibles, would you please open up to Nehemiah chapter 6. We're going to be looking at the first three verses this evening. And I'll begin reading in verse 1, where it says, Now it happened when Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem the Arab, and the rest of our enemies heard that I had rebuilt the wall, Nehemiah writes, that there, and that there were no breaks left in it, though at that time I had not hung the doors and the gates, that Sanballat and Geshem sent to me, saying, Come, let us meet together among the villages in the plain of Ono. But they thought, it says here, to do me harm. So I sent messengers to them saying, I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave it and go down to you? Would you please join with me as we pray? Father in heaven, we ask that you would now give us ears to hear what your spirit would say to your church, to your pastors, your under shepherds, your leaders. I pray, Father, that you would move in a powerful way in just encouraging, Lord, and strengthening and lifting up. Lord, we ask that we would come to that place of resolving in our own hearts that leaders can't come down. We don't come down from the work that you have called us to be a part of. And so, Lord, we ask that you would add your blessing to the reading and to the study of your word. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people say, Amen. So the enemy went after Nehemiah. And I want you to notice this, because if he can get the leader, he can get the leader's followers. And so the enemy would seek to continue to harass Nehemiah, to instill fear in him, and to ultimately, with the end game, being to get Nehemiah to quit the work of of the Lord. And the attacks of the enemy, if you haven't noticed this already, are often just like a terrible song that gets stuck in your head. It just won't go away. It's very repetitive. It's over and over and over again. 
But if you've been in the ministry for some time, you've already endured great afflictions. You've endured spiritual attacks. And you would think that the enemy would give up after all the times that he's failed to take you out. But you see, the enemy doesn't move on. He doesn't move on from you or from your marriage or your family or your ministry. See, Satan will attack before you even get started. He'll attack once you've started. He'll attack when you're halfway through. And he'll even attack you when the work has been completed. You know, we've heard of Sanballat in our text tonight in Nehemiah chapter 6 of Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem. But did you notice that the list didn't stop there? For Nehemiah writes about, quote, end quote, the rest of his enemies. The rest of his enemies. Sir Winston Churchill said this, and I quote, You have enemies? Good. That means you've stood up for something sometime in your life. End of quote. And for each of you that have heeded the call into ministry, you have stood up for the things of the Lord. You've said, here I am, Lord, send me. And so I ask you at the onset tonight, will you continue to honor the Lord with his call on your life? Will you continue to push forward into the ministry that he has called you to be a part of by serving and ministering and leading and walking worthy of that calling? I hope that you would say, yes, I will. But understand, and as pastors and leaders here tonight, the enemy can ruin the lifetime of a minister's work at the end of his life. Satan can destroy a lifetime of ministry at the end of one. Younger men that are here today, younger pastors, Pay attention. The enemy can ruin a future of ministry before it even gets started. And those of you that are established and you've been around for a little bit of time, the enemy can ruin the ministry that was behind you and that which lies ahead. And so we read of Nehemiah that his enemies, all of them, had heard that he had rebuilt the wall. And this is fascinating to me when I read of all of his enemies catching wind of the work that he was doing. Now, I've often wondered, and I wonder if you've ever thought about this. I've wondered, what's more important? Being known in Christian circles or in the enemy's camp? Think about that for a moment. Well, I would present to you today that it's more important to be known spiritually in the enemy's camp than to be known in Christian circles. Case in point would be from Acts chapter 19. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there. Verses 13 through 15, I'll read it, and it says, Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call upon the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, We exorcise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. And also it says in verse 14 of Acts 19 that there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest who did so. And it says in verse 15, The evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, Paul I know, but who are you? And there are a lot of individuals that would fall under the umbrella of quote-unquote well-known Christian this or that, but they are really the furthest thing from impacting the kingdom of darkness as you could be. And the reason for that is that they're doing more for the work of the devil and the enemy than they are for the Lord because they don't hold fast to sound doctrine. They don't know what God's word says, and because of that, they don't live it, and they don't know how to teach it. And that's why it's so important what you're doing in your churches as you just day in and day out are faithful to the calling that God has upon your life to open the word of God. And then as we read The rest of Acts 19, verses 16 through 17, it says, Then the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them. These seven sons of Sceva overpowered them and prevailed against them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. And this became known, verse 17, both to all Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus. And it says, And fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. 
right there was a separation between those that knew Jesus and were known by the enemy because of the work that they did through the power of the Holy Spirit and those that were imposters, those that were pretending to be something that they were not. And if we are not working for the Lord and the power of the Holy Spirit, we will run in fear, wounded and exposed for the compromised workers we are. You know, if we have men and women in ministry, if we have pastors in ministry that are looking at pornography or in DMs, which are direct messages on social media that you ought not to be dabbling in, you're being deceived. But understand this. If you're being tempted in an area of your life, it means that there's something in your flesh that is enticed. And the enemy would seek to exploit it, but... Your Savior would seek to strengthen you through it as you resist the devil and you conquer it. And each time you say no to the lust of the flesh or no to temptation, you become stronger because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Jesus is known by the enemy. Paul the Apostle was known by the enemy, but I ask you, what about you here today? Sooner or later, the word's going to get out about who you are and what you're called to do and what you are doing in service of the Lord. It's a lot like the prophet Elisha. In 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 8-12, through 12, we read, Now the king of Syria was making war against Israel, and he consulted with his servants, saying, My camp will be in such and such a place. And then it says, the man of God sent to the king of Israel saying, beware that you do not pass this place for the Syrians are coming down there. So then the king of Israel sent someone to the place of which the man of God had told him. And thus as he warned, and he was watchful there, not just once or twice. It means this happened over and over again. Finally, in verse 11, it says, The heart of the king of Syria was greatly troubled by this thing, and he called his servant and said to him, Will you not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? There's got to be a spy in the camp. Every time we set up camp, the king of Israel goes in the opposite direction. What's going on? But then listen to what the servant says. There are no spies, my lord, O king, but it's Elisha. The prophet who is in Israel tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. It is the Lord through his prophet Elisha that is causing you all of these problems. And I don't know about you, but I'm thrilled at the thought of foiling the enemy's plans to destroy our children. I'm thrilled at the thought of baffling the enemies of the Lord through the wisdom of the Holy Spirit at work through men, pastors, that God has called to lead in such a time as this. And if you look back in our text in Nehemiah 6, verse 1, he says, Our enemies heard that I had rebuilt the wall. And that there were no breaks left in it, though at the time I had not hung the doors in the gate, that Sanballat and Geshem sent to me, saying, Come, let us meet together among the villages in the plain of Ono. But they thought to do me harm. And he says, I'm doing a great work. So I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave it and go down to you? Being that this is the Heartland Region Senior Pastors and Leaders Conference, I wanted to ask you some pretty pointed questions. These aren't questions that you would typically ask on a Sunday morning service or, you know, that kind of thing. But I want you to be honest with yourself and just listen to what I'm about to ask. I have five questions for you. How many of you here tonight could say honestly that you deal with a lot of stress in the ministry? You can raise your hand if that's you. Boy, some of you that don't deal with any stress, I think I need to go to your church. How about this? How many of you feel or deal with the feelings of being lonely, isolated, or without real friends, like in the ministry? Thirdly, how many of you have dealt with the strain of how to deal with politics correctly? 
Fourthly, how many of you have experienced family problems, attacks, or challenges because of the ministry? It's taken a a toll on family, children. And then lastly, how many of you have ever felt like you're not going anywhere with your church? Like, I don't think it's growing, or I don't think it's where it should be. Well, David Barna and his group actually recently came out with a new statistic that I feel extremely enlightened by. And it was titled, Quitting Pastors. And it said, these are the top five things for why pastors across America quit the ministry today. The first thing was 50%, actually 56% of the pastors that quit the ministry did so because of immense stress of the job. 43% of the pastors that quit the ministry did so because they felt lonely and isolated. 38% quit because they didn't know how to mend the political divisions in their church. Fourthly, 29% of pastors quit the ministry because of the negative effects on their family. And then lastly, nearly 30% of pastors quit the ministry because they felt that their church wasn't going anywhere. And even tonight, with a show of hands, there are many of you that have dealt with the same exact thing. The stress of ministry is great. It's very high, dealing with problems and pain and discouragements and finances and you know people lying about your impossible situations. It's so difficult to process those things that we're engaged in day in and day out. Our family members are attacked, our spouse, our children, even people that we're close to. Because the enemy is always attacking and always plotting how to attack the work that you're involved with. I hope you understand that. Jesus is coming back soon. And people are falling off left and right. And the enemy will do anything that he can to get us to come down from the position that God has placed us in. Discouragement. The fear of man. The fear of failure. Anxiety or problems or or comparison. And the devil, your enemy, my enemy, will employ anything that he can do to get your eyes off of the Lord and to quit the work that he has called you to do. Did you notice in our text tonight in Nehemiah 6? And, you know, it's a passage that we've probably all read a lot. You've probably taught it. But did you notice how the enemy wanted to meet with Nehemiah? Why? Well, we know from the entire letter it was so that he might discourage Nehemiah in his work and ultimately destroy him. And so I need to ask you tonight. Do you meet with the enemy in your thoughts by entertaining the fiery darts of the wicked one? Are you led astray because of these thoughts that pop into your mind, whatever they may be? How many of you, I wonder, may not even realize that you're meeting with the enemy when you mess around in sin, not fully grasping that the enemy always seeks to do you harm? Always and especially those that are called as ministers of the gospel. Distraction. Look what's happening over there. Discouragement. Well, look what's happening over there. Discontentment. Look what's happening over there. Destruction. You should have kept your eyes focused on your work. I like to highlight... Nehemiah's response to his enemies. The first thing that he says is, I am doing a great work. Listen to me very carefully, please. I want you to be encouraged by this and understand this truth. The Lord's work is great regardless of the size of the ministry or the location of it. When you're struggling, though, and I've been there too, When you're struggling, it doesn't feel like it's a great work. When you're discouraged in the ministry, it doesn't feel like you're a part of a great work. When you're feeling lonely, it doesn't feel like a great work. 
When you're not seeing the results that you are hoping to see by now, it does not feel like it's a great work that you're a part of. Because the great works, they're taking place at somebody else's church, not yours. How about this? When it's low attendance, it doesn't seem like a great work of the Lord. You know, there's nothing quite like opening your Sunday morning service. Hey, good morning. Welcome. It's great to see both of you here today. Mom and dad, thank you. Or like one guy that I heard who was pastoring and uh, he kind of got startled as he walked up to the pulpit and it was low attendance and he's like, Lord, can it get any worse than this, Lord? How is this even possible? I have two people in the audience and they're not my mom and dad. But Lord, what is going on? And he was startled as those two people got up and walked on stage because they were part of the band that was leading worship that day. And he thought, I have no one in my audience today. It doesn't seem like a great work that I'm a part of. It seems like it's dying. Why do you think Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, be immovable, Always abounding in the works of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not or never in vain. And maybe a simple word of encouragement for you tonight would just be that the work that you're doing is important. Regardless of who may acknowledge it. Regardless of who in, you know, Christian circles may know of it. Here is a cold, hard fact. If Satan cannot get you with disobedience, he will seek to get you with discouragement. And he doesn't discourage those that are not about their father's business. If you're obeying the Lord, then you are not in disobedience, and Satan doesn't like that, so he's going to try to discourage you in your work for the Lord. You know, one of the things that I think are so important about these kind of conferences and and really what Calvary Chapel has stood for for many, many years, the systematic teaching of the word simply, simply teaching the word of God simply, is that when we come to conferences like this, we're reminded that we belong to something that is bigger than us and greater than our own church that we actually have other brothers and sisters that are around even our region that are going through the same kind of things that we're going through. Trying to do the same thing and being obedient to the calling of the Lord to teach the word of God, to be a faithful minister, to not give up, to not quit. Our family might be struggling or our personal life might be hurting. The church might be going through something and we're like, we've had it, I'm done. But did you know A man by the name of Chuck Smith shared that for over 17 years he was discouraged in his own ministry. He called his own ministry ineffective. Self-described. Ineffective ministry. But then I like to read to you this excerpt from one of his teachings because I just found that it was phenomenal. And I quote, And God began to tell of the ministry as somebody prophesied over Chuck Smith before he became the pastor of a little country church on the edge of town called Calvary Chapel. And someone prophesied over him that the Lord was going to give him this church and it would be blessed and that the church would grow. He writes, it seems at the time like it was so totally unlikely. That time, the Lord actually said that he was going to give me a new name, which meant shepherd, because he was going to make me the shepherd of many flock. He says, before I came down to there on the border of Santa Ana and Costa Mesa, a group of people were in prayer as to whether or not I should come down. And they asked me to come down and to take over here at Calvary Chapel. And they were in prayer in regards to it. And the Lord spoke to them through prophecy. And they said that he was going to be coming down, that the Lord was going to bless the church, and they were going to outgrow their facility, move into a new facility. There was going to be a radio ministry, and all of these things that ended up coming to pass. Wow. 
in some 50, 60 years. Here we go. And Calvary Chapel is still teaching the Word of God. And we can draw upon the faithfulness of the Lord in our past to encourage us in the future. But what if you're here tonight and you haven't had somebody prophesy over you? Some great prophecy that's come to pass and you're just trying to make it every day. Well, Peter, he had this amazing experience on this mount called the Mount of Transfiguration where Moses and Elijah joined Jesus right there and Peter heard God the Father say, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. But even more important than Peter's personal experience was the written word of God. And he writes to this end in 2 Peter 1.19. He says, We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the day star arises in your hearts. It's the word of God. And through the darkness that is in this world, the word of God is a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. Your service unto the Lord, whether you're getting attaboys or pats on the back or not, is important. You're doing a great work. You're a part of a great work. So Nehemiah says, I'm doing a great work. And secondly, he states emphatically, I cannot come down. I cannot come down. Really, in the original language in in the Hebrew, this can mean I can, or I have rather, the power to not sink to your level. This couple of words come down. Yarad. It means to come down or to sink. He tells his enemies, I will not sink down. So Nehemiah acknowledges the work that he's doing is very important because it is the Lord's work. But again, from the original language in Hebrew, we see something very fascinating where he says, I cannot. Really, this is defined as having the ability or having the strength to prevail or overcome, to endure or to have the power to be able to not sink down or come down from the great work of the Lord. You know, the Lord began preparing this message in my own heart over a month ago. I didn't understand at the time that the Lord would be using one of the most difficult situations in my life to bring me to a place where I would understand who He is in a much deeper way. And I wish, in full disclosure, I wish with all of my heart that I could learn more about the Lord without having to go through difficulties. I really do. I wish that my faith could grow exponentially without ever having to use it. Jesus, as you know, was a man of sorrows. He was acquainted with grief. And often it is the case that we as under-shepherds learn not only to be acquainted with grief, but what to do once we meet it. Exhaustion. And grief are such powerful tools in the hand of the enemy to work in the flesh, but they're even more powerful in the hands of my heavenly Father at work in my spirit. I have a kind of little bit of a a dated picture of my family. I don't know if they have it to, to put it up on the screens, but one of my, I have four kids. My oldest son is 14, Hudson. Uh, who's just the best big brother that you could ask for. I have a 12-year-old daughter, Ava, who has special needs, and uh, that's them. Now my son on the left is taller than his mom, and that's Hudson. And then Ava is my daughter with special needs here. Harry is the little guy on, on my left, and the little baby is baby Georgie. And my wife and I always laugh that we decided to have more kids because we hated sleep so much that we would have a a fourth child. But we are in this place where with my daughter, between 1 a.m. and 3 a.m. every night, I don't know what the reason is because she can't speak and she can't walk. 
But between 1 a.m. and 3 a.m., every evening, my daughter wakes up crying and moaning. And as a dad, it's a very difficult place to find yourself in when you're incapable of helping your children, when you're incapable of helping your little girl who's hurting. And I sat on the top of my stairs, and I was praying, like, Lord, would you please help? Would you please help, Lord? For 12 years we've done this. Lord, please And I had these feelings of sorrow. And just to be honest with you, anger and frustration as if God wasn't hearing my prayers. But all along, the Lord was listening. And he was working. And the Lord revealed something to me that night through a prayer that he put on my heart to pray. And that prayer that I felt like the Lord gave But it would you show me the path upon which full and difficult of circumstances? See, in ministry, in family life, in your own personal life, there are so many things trying to. Just like Nehemiah's enemies were trying to bring him to cause you to sink down. But with the power of the living God at work in your life, you have the ability to refuse to be brought down by any circumstance, regardless of how difficult or how painful it may be. And that ability comes only every valley of shadow and death has a path of righteousness upon which you can walk. But that path is hidden from physical perception. It's spiritually discerned, and its paving stones are comprised of the word of God illuminating each step. So Nehemiah says, I'm doing a great work. I will not be brought down because I'm not going to come down, and I will not sink down. And thirdly, he says, the work ceases if I sink down. And that's exactly it. It comes down to coming down. How does coming down work? As you're busy with the work of the Lord, well, depression brings you down. Distraction brings you down. Discontentment brings you down. Disobedience to the Lord brings you down. See, the work ceasing and your destruction is the last part of coming down. Now, there are some of you leaders here today that are just starting out in ministry. And you're charging ahead. But beware of compromise. Beware, I would even say, of comparison. In John 21, verses 21 through 22, Peter said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? And Jesus said to him, if I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Especially in the social media age, it's so easy to look at what they're doing over there or how what, you know, what they have to work with or what they're doing over there or whatever it might be. And you compare yourself. There will always be someone doing something better than you or doing something more than you. And listen, it's great to learn from others. It's important to grow and to improve and to glean from what others are doing. But if you become discouraged because your ministry doesn't look like someone else's ministry, watch out. You do what God's called you to do, and you let them do what God's called them to do. Now, there are some of you leaders here today that are in the middle. You're not starting out. You've been going at it for a while. Might I just say, beware of exhaustion. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 3, it says, For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself. This is Jesus that the author of Hebrews is speaking of. He says, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. When I was a younger man, 
I struggled with how a couple of older guys that were in the, middle, in the ministry that I even considered friends back then decided not to handle things in a biblical manner, but ended up causing a lot of division, all because they did not want to do things the right way or the way that honors the Lord, because sometimes handling things the right way takes a lot more effort than handling it the wrong way. At the time of great illness and being near death, King Hezekiah cried out to the Lord in Isaiah 38, verse 3. He says, Remember now, O Lord, I pray how I have walked before you in truth with a loyal heart and have done what is good in your sight. Might I just say, for those of you that are established here this evening, For the sake of all the young pastors and leaders that you don't even realize, look up to you as big brothers in the Lord. Do what is right in the sight of the Lord. Don't cut corners. Don't forsake the truths of the scriptures, even when it comes to practical things. We need you to keep going strong. We need you to keep blazing trails so that we can follow in your footsteps. And may it be for you as it was in Hezekiah, In the aforementioned instance where he looks back on his life and he says, I have walked before you in truth, my heart has been loyal, and I have done what is good in your sight. There are some of you leaders here tonight that are at the end as you're passing the baton. You're at the end of your ministry. And you have a legacy. And you, with blood, sweat, and tears, have... Work day in and day out. And you've discipled. And you've raised up. But beware of letting your guard down. In 1 Corinthians 9.27, Paul writes, But I discipline my body and I bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. There are a whole lot of disqualifications taking place right now. And it's heartbreaking. And some are dear friends. So finish strong. Stay strong. Because we all need you to do so. Paul wrote in 2 Timothy 2 verse 5, Also, if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. And the rules for the pastor and the leader in the church are, Be holy as I am holy, says the Lord. We're seeing how in an instant, an entire reputation of ministry can vanish. Don't allow that to happen. Even at the end, you're the pillars upon which future generations stand on. And it may seem as if the Lord is not hearing your prayers or seeing your plight. But he is very much aware of what's happening. And he's very much at work in your life through the trial you're currently in. The reality is we don't often see it. The temptation is because we don't see Jesus at work, we don't believe it's actually happening. John 20 verse 29 from the New Living Translation, Jesus says, You believe because you have seen me, but blessed are those who believe without seeing me. When Timothy was to follow Jesus into the spiritual battle of Ephesus. And in so doing, following after the Lord, he would need to draw upon the past faithfulness of the Lord and hold fast to his faith and good conscience. Do you have a clear conscience before the Lord? I mentioned earlier that some of the stresses of ministry are being faced with impossible situations. When you try to calculate it out, you know, if this happens, then who is that going to affect here? And then how is it going to spread over there? Or whatever, all oh, this just looks bad either way, shake it. But for you pastors that have to make tough decisions, ask yourself, does this have biblical precedent? Am I making a decision that honors the Lord? And then ask your wife, Nothing bad has ever come from asking your wife her opinion. I'll tell you, with my wife, we came to a conclusion that 
do we have biblical precedent? Honey, are we on the same page? Like, I trust your opinion. Like, are we on the same page? Yes. And then you make that decision to honor the Lord no matter what may happen afterwards. And you will find that as time goes by, because the word of the Lord endures forever, so will the righteous lasting effect of your decision and actions be. In the long run, it goes well for the righteous and poorly for the wicked. So hold fast, white knuckle it to your faith and your good conscience. Because some reject their faith and ignore their conscience. The work that you're doing is a great work. So don't allow anything that the wicked one may throw at you cause you to sink down. Cause you to give up, to fall, to stumble, to have the great work that God has called you to do cease. Because you have the power of the Holy Spirit enabling you each day, each day to overcome. And if you don't sink down, and if you don't disobey, and you don't get distracted, then that great work that the Lord is doing in you in your marriage, in your family, and doing in your ministry will not cease. It will not. So may the Lord speak to you over the next couple of days as you wait upon him. So God bless you. Keep up the good work and enjoy the rest of your time together. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for opening the doors of grace Calvary Chapel here in St. Joe. Thank you for all that have traveled. Thank you for all that are on their way that will be here tomorrow for the official registration and the weekend commencing. We pray that through our time together that it would be as iron sharpening iron. I pray for those that are here that may see somebody that they do not recognize or they have not yet met that they would show themselves friendly because a friend shows himself friendly. I pray that there would be some great connections that are made with brothers and sisters in Christ, that they would be mutually encouraged. Lord, I pray for future missions trips together, retreats together, conferences together, family events together. I pray, Lord, that you would start to Build and move by the power of your Holy Spirit, specifically in this heartland region, Lord. We pray for a great work of your Holy Spirit, that there would be a lot of cross-pollination, a lot of working together, a lot of reaching out, staying connected, praying for one another, encouraging one another, coming alongside and helping one another. And Lord, we ask that you would bless the remainder of this conference and this time that we have together. And Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, brother. Well, tonight we're just going to close in a final song, but um, as, as Pastor Garrett was sharing that word, um, I just, uh, I believe the Holy Spirit just spoke to me, a word I want to encourage you guys, leave you guys tonight um, to think about. What, I know it's the English language, but whenever I read that story in, in Nehemiah 6, I think, man, if anyone ever invites you to a valley called Ono, it's got to probably be a good sign that something bad's about to happen. Uh, but in, in all reality, I, I am, what really captures me when I, when I read that story is how the enemy's motives are always masked with a lie. And I want you to think about that this week. The enemy's motives are always masked with a lie. Remember Judas when he was talking about Mary's spike nard that she broke on Jesus' feet and she lavished it. And Judas typified Satan, didn't he? We could, we could use that money for the poor. Planting this little seed of lies among the disciples. When What was his true motive? Oh, he wanted it for himself because he carried the money bag. Satan's lies are, uh, are, Satan's motives are always disguised. And that's why Paul said, lest he should take advantage of us, for we're not unaware of his what? Devices, his tactics. And uh, 
I want you to think about that this week, because I think maybe for some, uh, it's, it's been a matter of needing to identify the enemy's true motive. The enemy wants to destroy you. There's nothing more clear. He wants to wreak havoc. He wants to steal and to kill and to destroy. That is his, he is a liar and he's been a liar from the beginning, Jesus said, period. And he comes across as a diplomat. Oh, Nehemiah, we just want peace. We just, we just want to talk. No, he wa- they want to assassinate him. But what did Nehemiah know? They sought to do me harm. In other words, he saw through the lie. And you guys, we need clarity to see through the lie. To see through the lies of success, to see through the lies of, of pleasures and wealth and comfort in the world, to see through the lies of political persuasions that seek to present evil as though it was good and good as though it was evil. We need to see through the lies because later in that chapter, you're like, Josh, stop preaching. It's not your turn. Just give me a chance to finish this. Later in the chapter, Sanballat hires a spiritual prophet. He goes to Shemaiah's house, right? Oh, Nehemiah, we need to go seek the Lord about it. We need to go to the temple because they're going to kill you. Trying to plant fear in Nehemiah's heart in the name of the Lord. And he was hired by the enemy. I pastored three churches. I've moved a lot, and every single place I've ever gone, there's been someone in the church that has tried to plant the enemy's fear and lies into my heart to accomplish your own goals because they're bitter, because they're angry. Some knew it, some didn't. But here's the thing, pastor, church leader, pastor's wife, who's attached to everything that happens to your husband, See through the lie. How do you do that? You keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. Lord, we thank you tonight that you've spoken this word to us. And we are not to come down. We're not to sink down. We're not to go to the valley to try to negotiate with the enemy who seeks us harm. We're to go to the mountain and fellowship with the Lord. We owe the enemy nothing. We owe you everything. And so, Lord, uh, tonight we sing this song. We give you our undivided heart. Just take us tonight. If there's even sin that's being challenged and convicted in our hearts, we would just lay it at the cross tonight. We would repent as we even start out this week, this conference. Lord, I pray for some good conversations, some good times of prayer, some good rallying around this truth that the work of God is great and we cannot come down, we cannot sink down to an enemy that seeks to lie to us and to destroy us. But let us stay about the work that God has called us to, work of the kingdom. And so, Lord, we love you. I pray you bless and keep and speak and give rest and encouragement and strength to every person here tonight. And as we gather tomorrow, Lord, may it be a special day of getting to know one another, of intimate fellowship, and of strengthening of our hearts. Thank you for giving us a privilege to serve you here in this area of our country that so desperately needs an outpouring of your spirit and your truth. Be with our churches, be with our communities, be with our, the people you've called us a shepherd. And tonight, Lord, may you bless them. May you meet their needs. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to close in this song, and as Michael finishes up, you guys can feel free to fellowship um, in in the foyer, hang out, get to know each other, go back to your hotel, conk out, go to sleep. Uh, Just be blessed, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you guys tomorrow. 8 o'clock for a devotion, 7.30 for a check-in, and this first session starts at 9. God bless you guys.
prone to wander, prone to give my heart away to every anxious thought, to every lesser love, prone to worry, prone to doubt you're in control of every rising fall. But you transcend it all. Teach me your way, O oh Lord, and I will walk in your truth. Come unite my heart to fear you. And all I am is yours. And Lord, I will praise you. You can have my heart undivided. I'm prone to wander, I'm prone to give my heart away to every anxious thought. Every lesser love, I'm prone to worry. I'm prone to doubt you're in control of every rise and fall. But you transcend it all. Teach me your way, oh Lord, and I will walk in your truth. Come unite my heart. this all in your name. 